So uh, good morning for, for John and good afternoon for the people in Brazil and good evening, uh, Patrick in France. Uh, we're going to start uh, the PhD thesis defense of, of Bruna Costa Leopesio. Uh, the, the thesis was advised by me, Marcio Carvalho and Professor Mariano Michelon. And the uh, committee uh, members are Professor John Frostad from uh, University of British Columbia. Professor Lucimara de la Torre from University of, Universidade de Campinas. Uh, Professor uh, Patrick Tabelin uh, from ESPCI uh, Paris. And Professor Shima Parza from uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. So I, I thank the, the four of you uh, taking your time uh, and participating in the defense. A very international committee from Canada to France and there's a span of nine hours uh, time difference. So I apologize for John and Patrick who had to wake up very early or and stay awake until very late. And so we're gonna start. Before we start, I'll, I'll just need to give an announcement in Portuguese for those who are uh, attending, the students who are attending. Os alunos que estão assistindo a defesa, por favor coloquem no chat o nome e matrícula e se aluno de graduação ou pós-graduação é para ser contada a presença, contando como, como um seminário ou atividade é, extracurricular para o pessoal de graduação. Tá? Uh, so, uh, Bruna, uh, we're going to start your defense. Uh, you give the presentation that's going to be followed by uh, comments and questions by, by the committee. So, Bruna, the, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Márcio. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Uh, this is my PhD defense on gel based microcapsules, uh, production and applications. Professor Marcio Carvalho is my ad advisor and Professor Mariano Michelon, my co-advisor. I would like to thank you all for attending, especially the defense committee. I'm looking forward to hearing your comments and suggestions. Uh, now let me give you an overview of this presentation. First, I'm going to start with a brief introduction and literature review on microcapsules, their uses, production methods, and the advantages of using gel and gum. Then I'm going to show um, how we manage to produce and control the characteristics of uh, gel and microcapsules through microfluidics. After that, I'm going to explain details uh, the experiments performed to uh, study and control the response of different capsules to an external stress, to digestibility conditions, and to a permanent magnetic field. In the end, I'm going to make some final comments. Microcapsules are formed by a core material involved by shell. They range in size from one micron up to a few millimeters, and they can have a single core or multiple cores. Microcapsules are applied in several sectors of industry when a physical barrier between the core material and the external environment is required. They basically isolate their cargo and ultimately release it in a controlled way. Uh, the release uh, is, a, in general, a consequence of mechanical rupture by degradation, dissolution, or melting of the shell, or diffusion through it. Different triggers can be applied to activate the core release, such as temperature, pH, osmotic pressure, or external stress. The main benefits of uh, using microcapsules are protection from undesirable conditions such as heat or oxygen, targeting to specific uh, sites, controlled or sustained release of substances, uh, improved flow properties uh, by converting a liquid into a solid particles, which improves handling, usage, and storage and masking and pleasant uh, taste or smell. Usually microcapsules are formed from a double emulsion templates. So firstly, water and oil and water, or oil and water and oil, uh, double emulsions are formed. And then their middle phase goes by a solidification process forming the solid shell that isolates the internal content. Thus, the materials chosen to form the double motion templates and the technique applied to form them have a major influence on the capsule's final properties. The first registry of applying microencapsulation in a product is from 1953, when Green and Shiner uh, used uh, capsules with an oily interface that were ruptured by pressure to manufacture carbonless cotton paper. 
Since then, microencapsulation has uh, enabled the development of new products and the improvement of existing ones for a wide variety of industries. For example, they allow the incorporation of sweeteners, colorants, uh, vitamins, and probiotics to different foods and beverages. They have been used for encapsulation of cosmetic components as essential oils, anti-aging elements, and skin moisturizing agents. Uh, microcapsules can also carry the rejuvenator needed in self-healing asphalt pavements. And in pharmaceutical area, um, they enable site-specific and sustained drug delivery, increase shelf life, uh, reduce adverse reactions and side effects. And they also act as an alternative uh, administration mode of some medicines. Several methods to produce microcapsules have been developed over the years. I listed some of them here. Uh, however, most of the conventional techniques usually require two emulsification steps and present reproducibility and full control of size and shell thickness. More recently, uh, microfluidics technology has appeared as an alternative means to produce microcapsules in a more controlled way. It enables tuning the template dimensions and, and using a broad range of materials to form the, the shell of the capsule. Uh, of course, it has some uh, disadvantages as the size range that is limited to the order of tens or hundreds of micrometers, while some applications require smaller capsules. And the low production rate, since it is hard to scale it, maintaining monodispersity. Different devices have been used over the years. In 2005, uh, Utada and co-workers uh, developed this microcapillary device for generating uh, double emotions in a single step. It allows the control of the outer and inner uh, drop sizes and the number of uh, droplets encapsulated in each larger droplet. So the device has two uh, round capillaries uh, aligned inside a square capillary. Uh, the injection here on the right and the collection on the left. The inner face flows inside the injection capillary while the middle face flows in the space between the injection and the square capillaries and the outer uh, face flows in the opposite direction here in the space between the injection and uh, this, the collection and the square capillaries. So uh, water in oil and water or oil in water and oil uh, templates can be formed uh, depending on the materials chosen here inside the collection. So the outer is defined at uh, two flow regimes with which uh, it is possible to form uh, microcapsules with this uh, capillary. So the dripping regime, letter A here, and the jetting regime, letter B. The dripping regime produces monodispersed microcapsules here close to the entrance of the collection tube, while the jetting regime produces a long jet and, and the drops are formed downstream. The jetting regime is typically uh, irregular, resulting polydispersed droplets with diameters greater than that of the jet. Thus, drops can be formed over a range of flow conditions governed by the interactions of viscous, inertial, and interfacial forces, which can be described by the Weber and capillary numbers of each phase. The transition from uh, the dripping to the jetting regime occurs when the viscous stresses on the interface overcome the Raleigh platon stability that breaks the jet. Water in oil and water uh, double emulsions have been widely used as templates for microcapsules because the aqueous provide an ideal environment for the encapsulation of hydrophilic compounds. The microfluidic uh, formation of oil in water uh, in oil templates in turn has been uh, less reported. And this is the focus of uh, our research. This lack of uh, water-based microcapsules can be uh, associated to the sheer thinning behavior of aqueous polymer dispersions, which may hinder flow stabilization. Then CPN alternatives to solidify water-based polymers as well as to control their cross linking rate. The difficulty on achieving the continuous gripping flow regime due to the high viscosity of the inner and outer phases. The difficulty to choose the, uh, the ideal surfactant to stabilize each interface, as well as the oil types to compose the inner and outer phases, and the continuous phase of the final microcapsule dispersions being an oil phase, which may be a limiting factor to some applications. 
Dangan uh, is the natural, uh, vegan, non-toxic and biodegradable biopolymer capable of forming hydrogels in the presence of cations. Therefore, uh, it is uh, approved by several uh, regulation agencies. Its gelation process has uh, three stages. First, the molecules are in their natural uh, disordered coil state. Then when heated, they start to form these double helixes. And in the presence of cations, these helixes are connected, forming a well-structured branched porous uh, network. Uh, the valent uh, cations uh, are more efficient in, in gelation than monovalent ones. The gel form is strong, transparent, little permeable, malleable, thermal, and, uh, and pH responsive. And because of that, Jalangan has been widely applied in food and cosmetic products, especially as a texture agent. It can substitute animal gelation sweets and cakes, work as structuring agents in lotions and hair care products, act as depots of some medicines for sustained delivery, or even as agents uh, in tissue engineering being combined or not with other polymers. But despite its versatility, Jalangan has uh, only been scarcely explored as shell material. In 1996, our and co-workers uh, were able to prepare capsules by gelation of Jalangan around the core containing stark, calcium chloride and the model drug. They show that gelon is suitable for the formulation of sustained release capsules and also that the rate of delivery is most affected uh, by solvent uptake as they observe that the, the increase of the average weight of capsules per file here has the same trend of the delivery profile. Besides that, their capsules are uh, shown to be more, more efficient in sustaining uh, the delivery of the model drugs than uh, gel on beads. Based on what I presented, the goals of this research were to produce gel and microcapsules through microfluidics, uh, explore the possibility of suspending the gel and capsules with hydrophobic compounds in aqueous media, define conditions to monodispersity, and then study possible applications of gel microcapsules by testing their response to external stress, digestibility conditions, and magnetic signal. Now I will show how we produce gel-based microcapsules by microfluidics, controlling their diameter and shell thickness. Uh, these results are published on chemical engineering science. So as I said, we wanted to produce water-based microcapsules that could protect and deliver hydrophobic active compounds. In order to compose these capsules, sunflower oil was used as core and as continuous phase in which they are suspended, while uh, gel and gun was used to form the polymeric shell. So surfactants were used um, to stabilize the motion twin 20 in the middle phase and PGPR in the continuous phase. The calcium acetate added to the continuous phase here provides the ions that are needed for the gelation of gel and shell, shell and also acts as a co-surfactant, promoting an additional stability uh, for the droplets before the full gelation. The main properties of all phases are listed here on this table and the inner and continuous phase uh, presented a Newtonian behavior, while the middle phase presented a shear thinning behavior. The deformation rates during uh, the production of the droplets uh, at the droplet breakup region is usually on the order of 10 to 3rd. So uh, the middle phase viscosity was around 22 millipascal second. Uh, the decrease of the interfacial tension here between the middle of and continuous phases with respect to the interfacial tension between the inner and middle uh, phases is mostly because of the surfactants and the calcium acetate I mentioned before. We use a microfluidic device similar to the one proposed by Utada that I showed before. So it has uh, two round capillaries with separate uh, tips aligned in, inside the square capillary and it combines cold flow and flow focusing. It is built in a microscope uh, slide and its uh, dispensing needles are used to inject the fluids. 
The experimental setup is composed of three syringe pumps, one for uh, each phase that forms the capsules, the microfluidic device, uh, an inverted microscope equipped with a high-speed camera and a computer. The capsules were collected in a glass vial containing a small volume of actin. Soon after, acetate buffer uh, is added to, to the vial and the capsules go to the interface between the X and the acetate and the accent is then uh, removed. This recovery process ensures that in the end we have a suspension of microcapsules in an aqueous medium, which widens the possible applications for the microcapsules. Having defined the experimental setup and the phases composition I showed before, uh, the next step is to define the device dimensions and flow rates uh, that lead to this intermittent grouping regime you see on the video that is required to produce monodispersed microcapsules. This happens when the inner phase and the middle phase jets break here at the same time and position. In order to do so, we produce several microfluidic devices with different designs from A to G here. We vary the diameter of the, tip of the injection and collection capillaries and the distance between them. However, it was only possible to form uh, monodispersed microcapsules with uh, designs A and B. Then for each one of these two uh, designs, we fixed each phase flow rate at a time to describe uh, the diameter of the capsules and the, their shell thickness as functions of the production conditions. So we produced operability windows like this. Um, where the open squares here represent the combinations of flow rates required to produce monodispersed microcapsules. It's also possible to represent this data in the dimensionless form by defining the capillary numbers that govern this problem, comparing the drag forces to, to the interfacial uh, forces. In this example, with the interface fixed at 200 microliters per hour, we have the capillary number of the outer phase and the capillary number of the middle phase. They depend on the flow rates of the fluids, the device uh, geometry represented here by the diameter of the tips of the ejection and collection capillaries, and on the viscosity and interfacial tension of the fluids. So as I said, these uh, operability windows show the conditions to establish the dripping regime and produce monodispersed microcapsules, which happens here inside these uh, red lines. Outside it, we may have the breakup of the inner jet that should form the capsules when the middle phase flow rate is uh, below a uh, critical value. And the shear force exerted by the outer phase uh, along the interface is high or a backflow regime when the continuous phase flow rate is too high and invades the injection channels. Or the jetting regime with the formation of polydispersed microcapsules or uh, the production of microcapsules with multiple inner compartments when the middle phase flow rate here is above a critical value and the inertial force of the middle and inner phases becomes comparable to the capillary forces. By analyzing each point here inside this uh, red curve, we can establish how the diameter and the shell thickness of uh, the capsules are affected by each phase flow rate. So uh, we can write the capsule's diameter as a function of the continuous phase flow rate for several values of the middle phase flow rate. And we see that regardless the value of the middle phase flow rate, the diameter falls as the continuous phase flow rate rises because the viscous drag force between the continuous and middle uh, phases increases, causing the droplets uh, to detach quickly from the injection capillary. Since the curves for different values of the middle phase flow rate are very close here during the experiment, it was clear that we should change the uh, continuous phase flow rate to control the capsule diameter. Here, data is represented in the dimensionless form. So uh, we have the drop to collecting capillary diameter ratio as a function uh, of the ratio of the outer phase flow rate to the sum of uh, the inner and middle phases flow rates. And all data collapsed into this single power law curve here, which is similar to one reported for a different polymer. 
Now, when we analyze the shell thickness uh, dependence on the flow rates, we see that at a fixed continuous phase flow rate here, uh, we see, uh, the, the shell thickness rises with the middle phase flow rates. And it happens because that is more material, more uh, gel and gun to form the shell. It means that in the experiments, we should change the middle phase uh, flow rate to control the shell thickness. In the dimensionless uh, form, we have the shell thickness to microcapsule uh, radials ratio as a function of the ratio between the middle and inner uh, flow rates. And we wanted to write uh, an equation uh, to predict the shell thickness, which is this one here. Because the shell form is porous, it loses part of uh, the aqueous mass during the gelation and recovery steps. So the thickness of the capsule itself is thinner than the thickness of the middle uh, phase of the double emulsion that formed the capsule. So we have considered the water loss quantified here by the ratio alpha uh, between the, the water volume after and before solidification in the mass balance to predict the shell thickness. We also established that we could widen the operability window and vary the size of the capsules by changing the device dimensions. Um, and it can be very important to produce smaller capsules depending on the applications. This data also fits a power law curve with the same exponent of the other uh, power law curve I presented before for the other uh, design. So from this part uh, of the research, we concluded that we were able to produce gel-based microcapsules with tunable mechanical properties through microfluidics. And we also were able to establish the conditions for monodispersity. Um, we defined the effect of the flow rates and device dimensions on diameter and the shell thickness of the capsules that can be then used, uh, uh, used to encapsulate hydrophobic compounds and uh, suspended in aqueous medium. Now that we know how to control the properties of gel microcapsules, we can see how we can explore them uh, uh, with different applications, uh, beginning with their the response to an external stress applied by constriction. These results have uh, just been accepted by scientific reports. Dynamics of the formable microcapsules in confined flows is relevant for medical, pharmaceutical, food and cosmetic industries since um, they are present in physiological systems as arteries and veins, for example, and microcapsules are regarded as adequate models for living cells. Moreover, constricted geometries can be used uh, for triggering and controlling the, re the release of uh, microcapsules uh, cargo by applying the necessary external stress to the microcapsule. Besides that, recent studies have shown that uh, Microcapsules can also be used in enhanced oil recovery as mobility agents that block original water paths, resulting in increased uh, volumes of uh, oil recovery. These uh, same capsules here could be filled with chemicals and act as carriers for target delivery in specific areas. The adequate properties for each kind uh, of application here are different. Uh, capsules used as vehicles for triggered release, for example, must be easily ruptured in certain conditions, while capsules used to improve mobility ratio for IOR cannot rupture. As discussed in a recent review by uh, Bart and Biesel, uh, there are more numerical simulation studies regarding the flow of a suspended capsule through a confined uh, capillary than experimental ones. And most of the experimental analysis are focused on the determination of capsules uh, membrane properties and do not report the extra pressure drop associated with the flow of the capsule, which would be an important parameter to validate the numerical studies. Besides that, there are very few uh, observations of induce, uh, flow inducing capsule burst. So in this part of my thesis, we aim to study the flow of a single suspended microcapsule through a constricted capillary, establish conditions at which microcapsule flows without rupture, and define extra pressure drop as a function of flow conditions and microcapsule properties. So we use an experimental setup with a constricted capillary with a diameter of 300 micrometers and a constriction diameter of 100 micrometers. 
a fluid gen system linked to a computer was used to feed the suspension through the capillary uh, at constant flow rates and measure the inlet pressure response. An inverted microscope with a high-speed camera and a second computer were used to monitor uh, the flow. Batches of uh, gel microcapsules with different diameters and different shell thicknesses were uh, produced and used in these experiments, which were repeated at least five times for each system. All capsules were smaller than the capillary diameter, but uh, larger than the constriction diameter. The capsules were suspended in a sucrose solution to increase the carrier fluid viscosity, and the flow rate was uh, fixed at 0.2 milliliters per hour, which corresponded to uh, an average velocity of 800 micrometers per second uh, in the straight portion of the capillary. The dimensionless parameters that govern the flow of a suspended uh, Microcapsule through a, a constricted capillary are the dimensionless capsule diameter, the capillary constriction ratio, the surface capillary number, the Reynolds number, and the uh, viscosity ratio between the fluid inside the capsules, which is the sunflower oil, and the uh, carrier fluid, which is the sucrose solution. In this analysis, the capillary geometry, Reynolds number, and viscosity ratio were fixed. The dimensionless uh, capsule diameter, which is the ratio between the capsule diameter and the constriction diameter, and the surface capillary number uh, that represents the ratio of viscous forces um, that deform the capsule to the membrane's elastic forces were varied. The surface capillary number depends on the viscosity of the carrier fluid, on the average velocity of the flow, on the uh, shear modulus of the shell material and on the shell thickness. During the experiments, uh, the capsules presented two types of behavior. Uh, they either return to their original undeformed shape after falling through the constriction, as shown here on the video above, or they couldn't support uh, the imposed deformation or stress and they, uh, the shell rupture at a certain level of pressure drop. In this last case here, when the shell rupture, the internal content was released. All capsules from the same batch presented uh, the same behavior. And after the experiments, all images extracted from the videos were processed with a MATLAB code based on frame difference to detect the moving capsules. Systems three and five here were the ones that did not rupture while flowing through the constriction, despite their differences in size and shell thickness. So uh, let's compare their outcome. On the left, uh, that is the evolution of the capsule tip position and the flow direction for one capsule from each one of these two systems. And on the right, there is the evolution of uh, the deformation quantified by the length of the capsule at a, uh, a given instant of time to the length of the undeformed capsule. Both systems uh, presented a reduction here in uh, velocity as they flowed through the constricted portion of the capillary and an increase in the formation. The capsule from system three represented uh, here in black, which has a larger diameter, uh, had more difficulty to pass through the constriction. So it stays trapped for a longer period and at the end, it is quickly expelled from the constriction. This capsule from system three starts to deform before the capsule from system five, and it sustains a larger deformation. As the capsules get trapped in the constriction, they partially block the flow, causing an increase in the pressure uh, response that can be seen here on this graphic. The initial and final pressures here are close to the one necessary to drive the continuous space along. The extra pressure associated with uh, the passage of uh, systems four and five here uh, were below the transducer, transducer resolution could not be measured. Analyzing the outcome for the systems with the same shell thickness and different uh, diameters, so systems one and three with shell thickness of 50 micrometers and systems two, four, and five with a shell thickness around six micrometers, we established that pressure drop um, rises with the 
the capsule diameter. And also that uh, since larger capsules need to deform more to flow through the constriction, uh, we could uh, cause a shell rupture by increasing the, the diameter of the capsules. Besides that, if we look to systems two and three here with the same diameter, but different uh, shell thicknesses, we see that the one with a thicker shell and consequently a, a lower uh, surface capillary number does not rupture. Putting all data together, we see that the state of the capsule after flowing through the constriction, meaning reversible deformation or shell rupture, is a, uh, is a function of the dimensionless capsule diameter and the surface capillary number. It's a fixed capsule diameter here that is a critical uh, surface capillary number above which the capsule bursts. And this critical surface capillary number decreases with the, the capsule diameter. So capsules uh, from systems below this transition zone here can be used in applications that require flowing through confined space without releasing the inner content, as for example, to block preferential paths in plural media. And capsules uh, above the transition zone in turn should be used in applications that require uh, releasing the inner content triggered by external stress imposed by the construction. So uh, concluding this part, we were able to run experiments with simultaneous flow visualization and pressure difference uh, measurements that allow analyzing the flow and defects uh, of surface capillary number and dimensionless uh, capsule diameter. Results show uh, that there is a critical surface capillary number above which membrane ruptures at each level of impulse deformation. Thus, this data could be used in the design of uh, capsules for specific applications and in the validation of numerical uh, models. Now let's move to the next trial to assess microcapsules response to digestibility conditions. When we say that something is gastro-resistant, it means that it can resist to the stomach environment, which has a low pH, and it can arrive intact to the intestine to release their inactive substance, for example. Thus, gas-resistant materials are particularly relevant for food, pharmaceutical, and biomedical industries. They are used in medicines and foods to protect unstable active compounds against gastric fluids, to delay active substances release, and to isolate drugs that cause nausea or vomit, or that uh, irritate gastric mucus. As I said before, John Gunn's a biopolymer with uh, several uh, valuable properties that is already being used in foods and pharmaceutical products, but not as a, a shell that protects the core. So with the experiment I will present next, we hope to verify if gel and gun microcapsules are gastro-resistant and suitable for triggered release in the intestine. We ran an aesthetic uh, in vitro digestion simulation follow, following a standardized protocol published in 2014 and improved in 2019. It consists of putting the capsules in a fluid that mimics the stomach content with its enzymes for two hours and then uh, moving the content to another beaker with a mixture that mimics the intestinal content and that let it there for two more hours. Each beaker is under uh, temperature and pH conditions uh, fitting the gastric and intestinal phases of digestion. Simulating the oral uh, phase of digestion in this case not required because the content stays uh, a very short period in the oral cavity. Despite being applied worldwide, this protocol does not account the dynamics aspects of digestion, uh, such as peristaltic or swallowing movements. So dynamic models are required for a more accurate uh, simulation of in vivo conditions. Nevertheless, the main advantages of an in vitro procedure are their high velocity, reproducibility, low cost, ease of handling, absence of ethical restrictions, and possibility of uh, multiple examinations at the same time. So we added a fluorescent pigment uh, to the inner phase of the capsules, and we used a Leica fluorescence microscope to visualize their integrity at each step of the test. 
So in time zero, before starting the experiment, we had this intact capsules of 160 micrometers uh, and six micrometers of shell thickness. Then we put the capsules in the gastric environment and after two hours, they were still intact, meaning that they are in fact gastro resistant. This is explained by the low pH value of the stomach that increases the ionic strength and decreases the repulsion between gel and double helixes, um, reinforcing even more the gel network that forms the shell and protects the inner content. After this step, we move the capsules to the intestinal environment with a higher pH. And after two hours, all capsules were destroyed and had their inner content released. Contrary to what happened in the stomach in the intestine, uh, the increase in pH decreases the ionic strength and increases uh, the repulsion between gel and double helixes, weakening the protection hindered by the polymeric shell. Besides uh, that, pancreatin has been reported as effective in breaking down gel networks, even though it's not a specific enzyme for polysaccharide hydrolysis. Thereby, we successfully concluded the in vitro digestion simulation of gel microcapsules that proved to be uh, gas resistant and able to release their content in the intestine. Therefore, these capsules are promising agents for the encapsulation of hydrophobic antioxidants, uh, probiotics, and enzymes for applications in pharmaceutical, biomedical, and food industries, for example. However, tests of encapsulation and uh, culture, as well as of in vivo experiments, are still required. Now let's go to the last set uh, of experiments to see how we can produce magnetic microcapsules and how we can control their response to an external magnetic signal. So ferrofluids are liquids made of magnetic nanoparticles suspended uh, in a non-magnetic fluid. They react to an external stress by moving to where uh, it is strongest, but they do not retain magnetization uh, in the absence of the externally applied magnetic field. The most common nanoparticle uh, is magnetite. It is possible to add ferrofluids to the core or polymeric shell of microcapsules, which then present similar properties of the original magnetic fluid. Such magnetic, magnetic capsules can be employed as vehicles for uh, triggered release that enable the remote control of their location by an external magnetic field. Their use is related to a fast infective accumulation of drugs in a specific area, which is beneficial for patients because it avoids side effects since only uh, pathological cells are affected and reduces uh, dosing frequency. Thus, our goals in this part were to produce water and oil-based um, magnetic microcapsules and study how their magnetic response can be controlled by microcapsule formulation. For the water-based magnetic microcapsules, we use gel and gun, and for the oil-based magnetic microcapsules, we used a polymer called PDMS, uh, which has valuable characteristics such as ease of fabrication, resistance to oxidation, thermal tolerance, flexibility, to the more hardness and has already been explored as shell material for microcapsules produced by microfluids. So uh, we use two uh, ferrofluids with magnetite, one aqueous, which was added to the inner phase of the DMS capsules, which is water in different concentrations, and one oily, which was added to the inner phase of gel and gun capsules, which is compolar oil, and to the shell of PDMS capsules, also in different concentrations. By then, so we produce magnetic microcapsules with uh, different sizes, different shell thicknesses, and different uh, concentrations of uh, ferrofluid in their core, or shell. And to compare the response to an applied magnetic field, we use this experimental setup with a computer, a high-speed camera, a microscope, a syringe pump, and this 3D printed device with aligned magnets 
to flow the magnetic capsules through a capillary with an inner diameter of 863 micrometers. Now, the physics behind this experiment. Um, both aligned magnets had their south pole closer to the capillary, so they repose each other. They create a magnetic field represented here by the gray arrows that start on the north pole and end on the south pole. These lines indicate the strength of the magnetic push or pull in each position. The more uh, tightly packed the lines are, the stronger the magnetic field is. The magnetic field in the flow direction uh, increases with the distance from the magnets until a maximum uh, point from which it starts dropping. Thus, when the magnetic capsule is in position C here between the two uh, south poles of the magnets, the magnetic field is very weak because the density of magnetic lines here is almost zero and the magnetic forces exerted by the magnets uh, represented by the red arrows cancel each other since they have the same modulus but opposite orientations. When the capsule is far away from the magnets as in position A here, it does not feel any magnetic field because the magnetic field is too weak there. The only force driving uh, these two capsules are uh, is the, the drag force exerted by the flow and represented by the dark blue arrow. Uh, if the capsules are uh, close enough to the magnets as in position B or D, uh, each magnet exerts an attraction force on it that is parallel to the magnetic field lines. So uh, in this case, the net magnetic force, which is the, the orange arrow is not zero and acts on the same direction of the, of the force with the same orientation or opposite orientation. Thus, as a capsule is flowing through the tube before the magnet sets up, the magnetic forces and the drag force act together. On the other hand, as the capsule passes the magnet setup, the magnetic force and the drag force uh, compete. If the drag force overcomes the magnetic force, the capsule uh, continues flowing. If it equals the magnetic force, the capsule stops in an equilibrium position. So we had uh, two different outcomes. Uh, from this test, depending on the system being analyzed and on the flow rate being applied. Uh, in the first case here, the capsule stopped due to the balance between the drag and magnetic uh, force. In the second, uh, the capsule flowed to, uh, through the magnetic field when the drag force was high enough. Both videos are from the same PDMS capsule with 75% of ferro fluid in its core. Uh, but in the first case, the, the flow rate was lower. The drag force on a stationary uh, spin puzzle flow can be calculated from this equation here, which is a function of the capsule diameter, the flow velocity, the fluid density, and the drag coefficient, which can be uh, extrapolated from data numerically obtained by uh, Song and Gupta. Thereby, we can evaluate the maximum magnetic force uh, acting on the capsules from the drag force in uh, equilibrium. For each system of capsules, we applied constant flow rates or flow velocities, and we could see in which cases the capsules uh, achieved the equilibrium position as the centroid uh, position stopped varying and calculate the corresponding magnetic force, including the maximum magnetic force associated to the highest flow rate. The range of flow rates vary depending on the system. This is the outcome for PDMS capsule with 75% of fell fluid in its core. For gel capsules, which uh, are smaller, the flow rates were higher, but the maximum magnetic force was lower. Uh, in fact, we had uh, different values of maximum magnetic force for its system, and this value varied uh, more than one order uh, of magnitude. If we compare, for example, the, the systems uh, made of PDMS with fail fluid in their core and with fail fluid in their shell. 
uh, it was clear uh, looking to to the results that systems with more ferro fluid uh, in their composition, due to the larger diameter or to the higher concentration of ferro fluid added, need, needed to overcome a higher magnetic forces to, to flow through the end of the capillary tube. So in this part, we produced water and oil-based microcapsules with a broad range of intensity of magnetic response by adding ferro fluid to their core uh, or shell. And we characterize it, uh, the, their magnetic response by flowing them through a tube exposed to a magnetic field. These capsules can be used in several applications as drug carriers or in MRI, for example. However, it would be interesting to make further studies with different capsules, uh, with different magnetic fields and uh, sensors. Summing up, I believe that the main contributions of this work are the use of gel gun, which is a very uh, versatile biopolymer as well as as gel material that involves a, a single core by microfluidics, and the definition of the conditions that lead to monodispersity with the operability windows I showed before. A huge advantage of these capsules is that they can encapsulate hydrophobic active compounds and be suspended in both water and oil medium. Gel capsules have great potential for several applications. With the construction experiments, we show that they can predict, we can predict if capsules uh, rupture or not, depending on their size and shell thickness. Um, and our data, uh, present valuable information for validation of numerical models with full visualization and pressure uh, measurements. We also showed that the gel capsules can be used uh, for target delivery in the intestine since they are gastro-resistant and because they are uh, monodispersity, the process uh, can be controlled. However, it is uh, still important to perform in vivo experiments as I mentioned before. Besides that, we magnetize uh, not only gel and gun microcapsules, but also PDMS microcapsules, which are oil-based. We show that the response of these uh, magnetic microcapsules to a permanent magnetic field can be controlled by the capsule formulation or size. This magnetization enlarged, enlarges uh, the applications of gel and microcapsules. With that, I would like I'd like to thank my family and friends, and especially my advisor, Mass Micro Advisor Marion, and the LMMP group. It has been a pleasure to work with all. Once more, thank you all for the attention. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Bruna, for your presentation. And now we start the, the phase of uh, questions by the by the committee members. I will uh, go from uh, east to west. So I'll start with uh, Patrick Tablin uh, and thank him again for participating in, in the committee. It's a pleasure uh, to have you.